What's up guys? Welcome to another installment of the Mountainside Apologetic series. And since this is Easter week, we thought it'd be appropriate to cover the issue of the resurrection as it relates to Christian apologetics. We know it's an important theological concept, but did you know it's also a very important and very well-researched apologetics topic? There's been philosophy that's gone into it. There's been a lot of historical research, a lot of biblical research, and it has come together to present a really strong case for what I consider is the central claim of the Christian faith, the Christian worldview. If the resurrection did not take place, consider the consequences. But if the resurrection did take place, consider the consequences. It's a polarizing topic. If the resurrection took place, then those who are not Christian have to rethink the reasonability of their non-Christian belief system. But if the resurrection did not take place, then the most popular religion in the world is without foundation. So what's the evidence? How do we go about thinking about the resurrection as it relates to philosophy and apologetics? How do we go about presenting it in a way that is winsome to those who maybe don't believe or have their doubts about the legitimacy of the resurrection? I'm going to help you through these things. Again, Buckle your seatbelts, get your brain turned on. This should be an enjoyable and engaging discussion here on the resurrection of Jesus on this Easter weekend. There's three big things that I found so far that the resurrection demonstrates. One, it demonstrates that Jesus is the Son of God, according to Romans 1.4. According to Romans 6.5, this is the reason we can speak confidently of heaven, right? A lot of people speak at funerals and they don't refer to the resurrection of Jesus. They don't refer to his promises, and yet they act as though their loved ones by default go to be with God. Why do we have that sense that we go to be with God? It's because we have confidence through the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection also means that this is the way that we are born again, and given a living hope. That's according to Peter's writing, 1 Peter 1.3. We are born again and given a living hope through the resurrection. No resurrection, no way to be born again, no new life, and no living hope. And in the midst of the world events that are going on right now, and the numbers that we hear daily about the death tolls, well, is there a living hope? Is there only despair and death? Or is there hope in death? That relates to the topic of the resurrection. If we come to have confidence that Jesus is our living hope because he was resurrected, we have a lot to offer the world. The most central passage about the gospel and the resurrection is in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, in our Bible, this comes after the Gospels, but in terms of chronology, this was probably written before the Gospels. And it's Paul saying, if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith also. Everything about the faith hinges on the resurrection. Now, to investigate this topic of the resurrection, we need to ask, why do people reject the resurrection? I know there's a lot of psychological issues. We're not going to try to pretend to know how people think. But we do want to investigate some of the claims that people have made. And no claim has probably stood the test of time more than David Hume's. He's a philosopher from the 1700s, an atheistic philosopher. He said, No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. This leads to a philosophical problem of begging the question, or its close companion, circular reasoning. Circular reasoning happens when someone assumes the thing to be proven. In this case, the faulty logic lies with the person who says that the resurrection must not have occurred because miracles like that don't happen. And we know miracles like that don't happen because there's never been a miracle like that. You see the circle? Is there any way to prove the possibility of miracles? 
And by the way, just to define miracles, I see miracle as a supernatural event, something that relies on a source that can't be explained by the laws of nature. So I think there are two good ways to show the legitimacy of miracles. And one, the foundation of the universe itself. As we've discussed in the cosmological argument, if you remember that, the start of the universe could not have been the universe itself. Anything in sequence needs something outside the sequence to get it going. Thus, something non-natural, something supernatural created this world. If this is the case, then any other miracle would appear to be minute by comparison. Some believe that the world is a constant miracle, that if God were to ever release divine control, all creation would fly apart. No atom would stick together. They see God not just as the creator, but as the constant continuer of the universe's existence and stability. If we're constantly looking at the miracle of creation, why would it be difficult to believe that other supernatural interventions may also be possible? You see the importance of establishing God as the supernatural creator before being able to establish something like the resurrection? We'll keep our apologetics in good order here. There is a second way to demonstrate the existence of the supernatural, and it seems as inescapable as creation. It's human free will. Free will must be supernatural in nature if it is truly free will. In other words, if a person is truly responsible for his decisions and actions, there must be something other than nature operating inside us. If he is only a series of natural processes, then all his actions are according to natural law, a law that cannot be interrupted. That would be a miracle. Therefore, every thought and decision would be forced but if there's a way to override the natural impulse and actually make decisions, then it seems to me that many miracles are happening every time a free choice is made. So there's a supernatural realm, and thus no reason to begin with the impossibility of miracles or the unlikelihood even of particular miracles. So this means that the resurrection is a legitimate possibility with no good way to determine its likelihood before the facts. Is its likelihood one in a billion? Or one in a hundred? Or maybe it's good odds, like two out of three? We have no reference point from which we can determine the likelihood of a particular action. Consider dice. Let's say I have a hundred dice, and they're all oriented to face one. What are the odds of that? Well, naturalistically, the odds are incredibly slim. And I don't hope to know how to calculate that, but suffice to call it impossible. But if there's an intelligent and intentional cause that has some reason to turn all the dice to one, then the odds are kind of incalculable near 100% if it's the intention of the person controlling the dice. So with the resurrection, with miracles at large, you can't really use odds like that to try to say what God would or would not do. You'd need to know the mind of God. And given that the creation is already here, the greatest miracle has already taken place, everything else is simple by comparison. So odds are no way to determine the likelihood of a miracle. They are no way to determine the likelihood of the resurrection. And this does not mean that there isn't anything to evaluate and that we should just believe every miracle or supernatural claim. Hey, Mary got burned into a piece of toast. Yes, every miracle is now suddenly legitimate and we turn into just a gullible people. That's not the way to go about it either. There, there's a better way. So a lot of supposed supernatural things are only natural things that are not understood. But this has nothing to do with the odds of a miracle. It has to do with honest reporting and true information. Okay, talking about the opponents of the resurrection, why do they deny it? Well, here's another catchphrase you might hear. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Oh, it sounds so nice, doesn't it? 
almost poetic. And that's to suggest that unless the spectacular nature of the data about the event matches the spectacular nature of the supposed event, we should not believe it. And so, given the overwhelming, extraordinary, and rare event of the resurrection, there's not enough historical documentation to make the event likely, and perhaps there couldn't possibly be. Even though it sounds like a neat axiom, there are some serious problems with it. First, how does one know the level to which a claim is extraordinary? Daily events are pretty extraordinary. Uh, because it's rare, though? Well, rare things happen all the time. In fact, you could argue that the same exact event has never happened twice. New things are happening all the time. If Jim chooses his white shirt among 100 options, and your friend comes up to you and says, Jim is wearing a white shirt, should you believe your friend? No, you think there's only a 1% chance that Jim is wearing a white shirt. That's a pretty extraordinary claim, given the rarity of it. Furthermore, you calculate that your friend lies about 4% of the time. Thus, it is four times more likely that he is lying than that Jim is wearing a white shirt. Wait, isn't there a problem with this reasoning? Sure. It's the fact that your friend has absolutely nothing to gain by lying about the color of Jim's shirt. Plus, if they're trying to deceive you about the color of Jim's shirt, your unsuspecting and sometimes disreputable friend would not be the way to do it. Send the boss or the police. Another problem with extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence is that it allows someone to arbitrarily set the standard for what extraordinary looks like. Is it extraordinary that Jim picked the white shirt? One may think that the odds of Jim picking the white shirt were 1 in 100 or 1%, but what if there was an announcement the day before that everyone needed to wear a white shirt? Or what if he chooses the white shirt every day? That's a lot different from Jim being blindfolded placed in a random closet with one white shirt among 100. And unless he picks the white shirt and the white shirt only, he's going to be fired from his job. What's the difference? One is chance. One is intention. When Christians refer to miracles, we're not talking about random chance, but intention. In other words, the odds of Jim picking the white shirt when he has every intention of picking the white shirt, are about 100%. A third problem with extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence is that it tends to judge the evidence before receiving the evidence. That's like firing Jim on the assumption that he would not pick the white shirt. And when he shows up in the white shirt, he's already been dismissed. Let's relate this a little more clearly to the resurrection of Jesus. And let's frame it around another claim from unbelievers. You only have one source of evidence, and that's the Bible. A 2,000-year-old book that has gone through so many changes. So biased, so, mm, so archaic. When we're talking about evidence, we need to relate the evidence, not to today's potential for evidence, but to the level of expected evidence from that time and place. We will also need to consider relevant evidence to the contrary. If there is a pill that instantly cures the coronavirus, we're going to hear about that from all the authorities and all the news sources. It's unlikely to be verified through a pop-up email. Magical cure! Act now! Now, on the other hand, there is the extraordinary claim that Timothy is going to marry Holland. I knew I was going to sneak that in. <laughs> but I only have two pieces of documentation. The actual invitation and a text message. I didn't get a text message or letter saying, please disregard the previous wedding announcement. It was a hoax. Should I believe it? When we look at the Bible and all the writings from that place in time, we only see the fact of the resurrection. There are no letters saying, please disregard the previous resurrection announcement. It was a hoax. 
There are not even opponents to the movement producing any evidence to the contrary. They say that it was causing an uproar, right? This resurrection, this message of Jesus. They could say they don't want to react to it, but they could not say that it didn't happen. In fact, Jerusalem found itself on instant damage control after the resurrection. Jerusalem! It'd be easy to claim that a resurrection occurred someplace on the other side of the world, but in the very same town? The place where it could be disproven is the place where it flourished. Why? I think I know why. Yeah, but you're just using the Bible, they say. On the wedding announcement, I don't have to know exactly how that got here. I don't have to consider it even flawless or inspired to know what it's communicating. I don't even have to know who exactly wrote it. I just have to consider that it relays accurate information. Relate that to the Bible. Plus, I'm not just using the Bible. I'm taking into consideration all the relevant data. If there were other accounts, I would take those into consideration also. So now let's turn to the reports and let's pull out the relevant evidence. First, do you need to establish the Bible as the inspired Word of God in all its totality before demonstrating the resurrection? Not necessarily. It may just be that you bring someone to a point of acknowledging it as an accurate historical document with honest reporting. So, I'm following the experts in this, and I think it's a good approach. Gary Habermas, William Lane Craig, and Lee Strobel, they like to take what's called the minimal facts approach to the resurrection. Habermas is probably the world's leading expert, and Craig did his doctoral research on the subject and has only advanced from there. He's gone into more research. Strobel has kind of gleaned off the expertise of others to become kind of a second-hand expert himself. So I think they have a good tactic. Now, what are the minimal facts? There's four of them that they promote, and might add a fifth. Fact number one, Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. Fact number two, Jesus' tomb was found empty. Fact number three, many people saw Jesus alive after this. Fact number four, the disciples would die in defense of this fact. And the fifth that I might add is there is a continuation in the effects of the resurrection. Let's pick these apart, but before we do, I want to mention the principle of embarrassment, because this is going to be important. It relates to honest reporting. So those who say the disciples made this up must point to some sufficient motive. J. Warner Wallace, who's an apologist and former cold case homicide detective, he points out that a crime always has a motive. Possible motives include hatred or revenge, power or control, riches, relationships or sex. Apparently it always boils down to these four. It's often not hard to detect the motive. However, the earliest proclaimers of the Christian message would forego these benefits in order to promote the good news of Jesus Christ. Power is probably the most common objection uh, regarding the disciples' motives. But when you read the accounts, writers typically leave themselves out of it. Are they really going for power? They seem to be promoting something other than themselves. That's why some people can claim that the gospel writers are anonymous. Have you heard that accusation? Uh, they're not totally anonymous. They were identified in some later church writings, actually really early church writings. If they were self-promoting, wouldn't the gospels be blatantly called Peter, James, John, and Andrew or something like that? But no, that was later Gnostic pseudepigraphal writings that took those false names to try to gain credibility. Not only did the disciples not glean any of these four basic benefits, but they at times identified themselves as screw-ups. Principle of embarrassment, right? They didn't shy away from the things that put them in a bad light, as long as it was with the truth. Remember, John said that he outran Peter to the tomb, which may be the only claim of self-promotion in the Gospels, in his Gospel at least. Is this self-promotion? Not really. 
read on. He goes on to say that even though he got to the outside of the tomb first, he was too chicken to go inside. So it was actually Peter who had the first look inside the tomb. Come on, John. You can change that little fact, make yourself the hero. Especially since most people say that Peter was dead when John wrote his gospel. Don't know about that, but you won't have Peter on your case if you say that you're the one that's the hero. No, it was Peter who went in first. This is the same Peter who wanted to include into the Gospel of Mark that Jesus rebuked him as Satan, and that he denied Christ three times, even cursing at a little girl. That's going to hurt his street cred when he starts preaching, but it's honest. These heroic disciples even included that they didn't think that Jesus would rise. They were slow in heart to believe all that was written and didn't keep in mind the things that Jesus had said about himself. Many places show the marks of honest reporting rather than any sense of self-promoting. Furthermore, we need to reject the accusation that the Bible is just one source. The New Testament is a compilation of eight or nine different writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, James, Jude, and whoever wrote Hebrews. It wasn't bound into one document until around 325 AD. These are independent witnesses who could say anything. They choose to tell the same basic story, the story of redemption through Jesus Christ alone. All right, back to the four minimal facts surrounding the resurrection. First one, Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. And there are opponents to all four of these perspectives. So in this one, the Quran denies that Jesus died, often citing the shameful nature of such a death. You know, God wouldn't let his prophet die such a shameful death, they say. And they say that Jesus either swooned, which is less popular belief, or was replaced, what most Muslims believe. Remember, one can't explain away a miracle that makes sense by invoking an even bigger miracle that makes little sense. Let me say that again. Because it is what Muslims and people of many other faiths do, one cannot explain away a miracle that makes sense by invoking a bigger miracle that makes less sense. You might say that's sort of a theological application of Occam's razor, Certain medical doctors who have examined the resurrection have concluded that surviving this would have been a miracle on par with the resurrection itself. And that's just taking into account what a crucifixion is and how Jesus in particular was treated. There are two other things that we need to consider regarding the crucifixion. One, it's easy to tell when a crucified person is dead. And these Romans were professionals in carrying out the death sentence. So why is it easy to tell when somebody on a cross is dead? Well, on a cross, you have to push up on your feet in order to catch a breath. So you're hung like this, your feet are slouched, and if you just let yourself slouch, your, your, your lungs cave in, you're unable to breathe, and they, they eventually fill with water. So you have to push up. Breathing is detectable for that reason, for the pushing up on the pierced feet. Look kind of like. <sighs> Effort must be put forth in order to take another breath. Jesus probably determined what his last breath would be. This is a view of, of James White that I just learned recently. He said that Jesus gave up his life. In other words, he determined what his last breath would be. And that's why the Bible describes him as saying his final words, to tell us die, meaning it's been fulfilled, or, or Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he breathes his last. Perhaps I'd suggest to match the time of the Jewish sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Onlookers could see, possibly for the next couple hours, the lifeless body of Jesus. The guards reported to Pilate that he was dead. They further confirmed it just before taking Jesus down off the cross. They pierced him in what is apparently the pericardium sac around the heart. 
This wasn't to kill him the rest of the way. They didn't do it because he was alive. It was to prove with certainty that he was dead. Gotta follow protocol, sirs. If they're not dead, you break their legs. Keep them from pushing up to breathe. That's why that happened with the thieves on the cross. If they are dead, pierce the heart. Blood and water comes out after death. This has been medically proven more recently, but I suspect the Romans knew about it. It's been proven that this only happens after death. And there would have been no reason for the disciples to write about Jesus' death with such details unless he actually died. They could have simply written about his miraculous survival without jeopardizing a good and redemptive story. Nobody took it as imperative to the story that Jesus would die. In fact, quite the opposite. They, they were ashamed of that kind of death. They would have rather had a story of Jesus not dying. So again, a mark of honest reporting and maybe some accuracy through embarrassment. Jesus was dead. And there was absolutely no means of natural recovery. All right. Minimal fact number two. Jesus' tomb was found empty. Isn't it interesting that the Gospels mention the person who had the tomb that Jesus would borrow, Joseph of Arimathea? He had to go through Pilate for permission, so Pilate tracked where the body was going. It was not some secret location. Remember, Jesus was very close with lots of people who were not old and senile. There was apparently no confusion about where the tomb was located. In fact, recall that when the women got there that Sunday morning, they said, they've moved him somewhere. There was never the thought that they had gone to the wrong spot. And later the disciples would check the same spot with no doubt about the location of the tomb. It's public knowledge. And the stone was rolled away. As they say, it was not rolled away so that Jesus could get out, but so that people could see in. Nobody expected the empty tomb. So the story would not have been contrived to match expectation. The women were taking their first opportunity after the Sabbath to memorialize the body with spices. They expected a dead body and nothing else. And what about the fact that it is women reporting this first? Probably the fact that you've been waiting on. If you are really trying to convince an empty tomb story, wouldn't you use reputable witnesses? Women's testimony was almost useless in that culture. And if you are the writer contriving a story, wouldn't you write yourself into it as the hero, the one who discovered the tomb and had no doubt? Instead, the women were first. They didn't think he rose to life. Then the disciples didn't believe the women. And they forgot some very important things that Jesus had taught. Embarrassment upon embarrassment. Finally, why would the guards have to make up a story to cover up their hides if the tomb wasn't really empty? Why couldn't they just say, no, no, we just put them in this tomb over there. You mean to tell me that the unsuspecting disciples maybe broke the Sabbath. They walked to the tomb so they could risk their lives with the guards fending them off while rolling away the stone so that they could rush off to who knows where with a dead corpse and then neatly fold up the laundry inside the tomb before rushing to their secret hideout. That's your alternative story? The only consistent conclusion is that the tomb was in fact empty. Minimal fact number three, many people saw Jesus alive. People saw Jesus alive. Were they just gullible? Were they mistaken, hallucinating, drugged up, drunk or something? What's going on? There is an interesting little piece of the report that says that Mary was suspecting him to be the gardener right at that first encounter with the risen Jesus. Hallucinations or contrived accounts don't make sense of the unpredictable things that Jesus said to them. And this is kind of a new point, just in this time going through it. 
Peter apparently didn't enjoy what Jesus said to him by the seashore. Peter, do you really actually agape love me? Peter, you're going to die a very unpleasant death. Seems like some honest reporting when Jesus says things that are unpleasant and unexpected. Okay, there's the bias witness argument. These people who wrote about the resurrection were all biased. They had an agenda to promote the deity of Christ, salvation through faith in him, etc. And we don't have writers that take a different perspective. So all the biased writers, how can you believe biased writers? Well, this is just not an accurate perspective of what it means to be biased. A biased perspective is one that assumes prior to the evidence. The disciples, on the other hand, adopted their views because of the evidence. They were clueless about these things prior to the resurrection. Why would their approach to life drastically change? Not so much during the life of Jesus even, but after the death and resurrection of Jesus. There is simply no strong alternative. Those close to the, the events can speak most knowledgeably about the events. And isn't it reasonable that they will speak passionately about the events if they have found the truth stemming from them to be powerful and important? Is there a mark of honesty in the eyewitness testimonies? Oh yeah. And quite a bit, actually. Again, most notably, the women were the first to see the vacated tomb and the risen Jesus. If this is a fabricated story, there's no doubt that they would have told it differently. Second, the creators of this movement would have put words into Jesus' mouth that would present them in a better light. The most affirming thing that they recorded Jesus saying after the resurrection is probably, go make disciples because all authority has been given to me. Wait, shouldn't it read, I give all authority to you guys? So go dominate the world. If the story was fabricated to their self-interest, it would say something like that. Third, no one stepped up as the strong and solid believer. No one anticipated the resurrection. No one led the charge. And this is often most evident in their own accounts. Instead, they don't believe the women and are not anticipating something that Jesus actually foretold. And fourth, they continued to be shaky after the resurrection had already occurred. Instead of being instant heroes, they mentioned that they preferred to call Jesus a ghost instead of calling him their risen Lord. And fifth, the accounts are appropriately different. If they're exactly the same, they'd be accused of collusion, right? Looking at signs that there's honest reports in the eyewitness testimonies, and you have this principle of appropriate differentiality. In a courtroom, the validity of two witnesses is actually thrown out if they retell the exact same story the same way. If they use the same terms, they take the exact same vantage point, that is worthless evidence. And beyond being thrown out, these two supposedly independent witnesses, they're often taken to be conspirators, a part of the crime. If they are too different, though, they'd be accused of blatant inaccuracy and contradiction. In a courtroom, one or both of them would be guilty of false testimony if they're too different. So can't be here, can't be here, got to be somewhere in here. And what do we see with the resurrection accounts? Well, skeptics weakly accuse the accounts of both collusion and contradiction. And that's kind of interesting for what we're saying here. They're unwittingly implying that there is a balance in the accounts between differentiation, but not so much as to be contradiction. So in reality, the differences are appropriate to the independence of each gospel account, but they're not so different that they contain irreconcilable differences. 
Okay, how many people saw Jesus alive? The earliest surviving record of the resurrection is probably in 1 Corinthians 15. This is early on in Paul's ministry, maybe early 50s or around 50 AD. 1 Corinthians 15 is a poetic summary of the good news. And some scholars believe that this dates all the way back to within months of the resurrection. He said, I, res- I give to you what I first received. So this was already codified and put into a somewhat poetic form at the conversion of Paul shortly after the resurrection. So verses 3 through 8 in 1 Corinthians 15, they lay out a similar logical sequence to the resurrection. Jesus died. He was placed in a familiar tomb. He was alive on the third day. He appeared to all the disciples, sometimes appearing to them separately and sometimes corporately. He appeared to in excess of 500 people at the same time. Finally, he appeared to Paul last, as though the runt of the family. So here you have Paul not really boosting his own status either. So were they hallucinating? Don't make me laugh. Really, uh, all these people hallucinated the same thing at the same time. Do you know what they call a mass hallucination? Reality. Were they mistaking this person for Jesus? He had holes through his hands and in his side still, in his feet. By showing Thomas this, he left no room for doubt. And they were within arm's length of him for like three and a half years. Okay, was it a ghost? He ate fish. Enough said. He touched them. They touched him. And why would a ghost have wounds? If he was a ghost, also, the tomb wouldn't be empty. All right, minimal fact number four. The disciples would die in light of this fact. There are a couple objections we can expect from this. Most commonly, so what? People die for things that aren't true all the time. Okay, yes, Islamic terrorists die for what they believe in. Even war protesters, tree huggers, and Jehovah's Witnesses who refuse blood transfusion occasionally die for what they believe in. What's the difference in the case of the disciples? Because it's major. As Habermas and Craig emphasize, all these people who are identified, the the Islamic terrorists, tree huggers, Jehovah's Witnesses, etc., They die for things they believe to be true, but could possibly be mistaken. But nobody, in no reported case in history, has willingly died for what they know to be a lie. That may have originally been Josh McDowell who researched that out. It starts with Stephen. Stephen and presumably many others like him. They also died proclaiming the gospel, which centers on the fact of the resurrection of Jesus, right? 1 Corinthians 15. No resurrection, no gospel. Stephen and the disciples were eyewitnesses. Had Jesus not truly risen, they would not have great confidence in this. If they did not have great confidence in this, they would not be willing to die for it. Paul said if there's no resurrection, this faith is useless. It would certainly not be anything worth dying for. It would be useless. If they die for it, it was worth dying for. If it was worth dying for, it was not useless. Only in the case that the resurrection is a fact of reality is it not useless. Therefore, the resurrection of Jesus is a fact of reality. Now, I said that I may add a fifth fact here. Not that the four are insufficient, but just to drive home a a point of application regarding the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. I think the fifth reality, it doesn't fit as well into the traditional apologetic mold. The resurrection is not just a fact of history, but a fact of the present. 
It struck me a couple Easter's ago, it took a surprisingly long time to sink in, that we say he is risen, not he was risen. Little verb nuance there, but it's major. Jesus' resurrected nature is a present reality. Not just off in some ethereal dimension out there. No, through the Holy Spirit, who he promised just before he died. Through this Holy Spirit, there is personal, intimate knowledge that we can have of the resurrection. He continues to bring dead hearts to life. He continues to make his authority over earth known. Power in the name of Jesus, right? May the Lord of the resurrection bring to life everything in you. We can know the fact of the resurrection, and we can know the personal power of the resurrection. Again, we're hearing so much news about death this Easter. Many people will pass away over Easter weekend, maybe thousands. But for those who die in Christ, placing their trust in Him, death is like the death of Christ. It is not the end but a new and glorious beginning. So that's why I think the greatest tragedy is not death. It's death apart from the one who is life. It is the fact that many people die rejecting the power of the resurrection of Christ. The disciples were certain enough to risk death to make this important news known. And what are you and I willing to do? Thanks for chiming in to this installment of the Mountainside Apologetics series. Fitting for this Easter weekend as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. This is our living hope and this is where we have new life. Because the promise is cemented in a historical fact of Jesus' resurrection. Go tell somebody. Go make it known. Love you guys. God bless and guide you.